So we'll get going today. We've talked about um, pressures at a point and also in a column, which of course uh, rely on the, uh, ma the material, the fluid above you. Um, and so this is a, an interesting exposition of that. As you'll see, some youngsters, uh, your age by the looks of it, could be high school, could be early university. Uh, looks like they might be from Stanford from the t-shirts they're wearing, but they're launching it in, uh, looks like Golden Gate Park, which is in San Francisco, just south of the Golden Gate Bridge. And they've uh, constructed a balloon and attached a camera to it. And the balloon has a uh, parachute attached to it. And it must have a phone or some GPS so they can track it. Uh, because they ultimately, I think they're not beaming this uh, to some receptor, but they recover the camera which has an onboard recording. So it's actually quite amazing, um, maybe kind of dangerous. You know, if you fly out of San Francisco, San Francisco International, SFO, one of the runways goes across the bay, east-west, and one goes north-south. So that runway usually takes off to the north, which goes over basically the Golden Gate and then heads across the Pacific to, to Asia. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure whether they got clearance to do this or not, but uh, they did it anyway. And actually, uh, you can see in some of these, they have these clips of, uh, they've uh, narrated it, annotated it, I guess, to be able to show what's going on. That's San Francisco on its peninsula, uh, as you can see. And it's at 40,000 feet, so the height of, of planes. Certainly taking off from SFO, you won't be at 40,000 feet by the time you get to San Francisco, uh, Golden Gate Park. You'll be at uh, 10,000, 15,000 perhaps. And it's carried uh, south from its launch plot uh, to 90,000 feet. So Everest 30,000, planes fly at 30 to 35. Um, I don't know what the edge of space is. Uh, there's this big debate over the Virgin, um, whatever they call it, the Virgin space shots, as to whether the people who go up on those are really astronauts or not, because there's a definition that's a NASA definition of space and there's a definition that other people use as an, uh, an altitude for space. And so uh, it's driven by a balloon. Uh, the balloon also relates to what we've talked about in terms of um, pressures at a point and, uh, and elevation. We can talk about how a balloon works, of course. Uh, it works because the density of the material in the balloon is less uh, than the density of the material outside, the, the fluid outside. Of course, factoring for the weight of a payload as well, it has to lift. And then it comes down with a, a parachute. And so I guess this is, I'm not sure how that's, I guess that's, uh, they must have a camera in the parachute looking down on the payload as well. So it looks like a very ingenious project. A uh, bit of uh, digital printing to make some components. Uh, it looked like they attached a, a, a Nikon or an EOS, Canon EOS, uh, uh, SLR, digital SLR to it to take these pictures, set it in motion and then just lets it record and then you have a chase car. Um, sometimes when you drive, when I come to work I see a hot air balloon, I don't know if you've seen that yet. The guy who runs that is a former environmental systems engineering graduate who would have taken the equivalent of this class at one time. Kevin, not Kevin Fry, Kevin, no, I can't remember his name. Um, and he does the same thing. They have a chase car, go after the balloon. Of course, you hope to have live people in your balloon who can call you in to come and pick us up. But this must have some uh, uh, beacon in it to be able to go and uh, uh, locate it. Or to find, I guess you could do it with find my phone, right? Uh, would be a simple way to do it if you put an iPhone in there. And then you go and pick it up and you travel back to it as well. So just quite an amazing project, I thought. Um, so that's partly related to what we're dealing with today. Um, what else? I guess I can, uh, I didn't get Equatio going. I guess I can do this. Uh, the other thing we'll talk about today is, well, we might talk about that. Maybe run this as well. We'll talk about methods of measuring pressures, which kind of follows on from our discussions of pressures around a point and columns of pressures, which we can define here. And of course, a manometer is one of those methods of doing that. A mercury manometer or a barometer measures air pressure. 
and um, this is how it works. Uh, we'll talk about the, the manometer rules, five or so manometer rules. One of them is that if you have an evacuated space at the top of this column of mercury, right at the top here, that has to be, by definition, at the equilibrium pressure between the mercury and its vapor. So it's actually the vapor pressure of mercury. And one of the reasons that mercury is used as a, a material in barometers, one is because it's super dense. It's like 13.6 times the density of water. So you don't need a very big column to be able to get a reading. And secondly, its vapor pressure is super low. Uh, it's essentially zero um, absolute pressure. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. So I'll put that on hold with Mrs. Mrs. Lab Professor, whatever her name is. Um, fluids in the news, of course. Uh, we do have fluids in the news today. Um, Hurricane Idalia. When I first heard that, I thought it was Vidalia, as in Vidalia mushrooms. But uh, Idalia is coming on shore sometime today, I think, later on today, in what I had never heard before called the Big Bend of Florida, which is where the the peninsula joins the panhandle. And uh, relevant to fluid mechanics is that it's a fluid mechanics system. It's uh, the atmosphere. It's rotating because the Earth is rotating. The reason it rotates the way it does is because the drag placed on it by viscous drag at the southernmost part of the uh, hurricane versus the uppermost, northernmost part is different because the velocity at the center of the Earth is higher than at north, more northern latitudes. So it puts a spin on it, Coriolis. And so it's uh, pushing uh, water on uh, land. They think the surge is going to be 10, 15 feet uh, in the, at the maximum in the Big Bend area of, uh, of Florida. And maybe if we have time, we'll uh, investigate whether that could actually be driven by the pressure differential. We know that within the center of a hurricane, the pressure is low. Uh, and therefore much lower than on the periphery, maybe a 0.1 of an atmosphere lower, 900 millibars rather than 1,000 millibars. And we can look to see if that could actually be the reason for the magnitude of the storm surge. It's not. So that's kind of what we'll do. So that's taken us more time than I imagined we'd use, but that's okay. We have lots of time to, to do this. So we'll follow on from last... Me. I made the point, I think, that we got through a whole bunch of math without doing math, which is fine. Uh, we don't need to beat you down. Uh, I, I'll never ask you to reproduce the, the derivations we did um, on Monday, but it's useful to know where things come from. I think it's useful that you know that everything in the fluid statics that we're talking about is F equals ma. If there's no acceleration as in a static fluid, it's just sum of forces equals zero. Um, when we talk about Bernoulli equation, which you've probably seen in your physics past, that is also F equals ma. And the acceleration is that in going fluid flowing from here to here, if it gets constricted in the flow line, then it has to speed up to be able to get through that constriction. And it's that acceleration is the ma, which actually comes out of the expression that we uh, developed last time. So that's it. So I won't ask you to re-derive these, but this was the equations that we have from last time, written in a slightly different uh, format. You'll remember that we could write out each of these individual equations, the most challenging of which was this bottom one, and it was that, well, I won't write it there, it was that dp dz minus rho g minus rho az is equal to zero. And so it's this term times this, this term times this, and this term times this, right, in this. And you'll remember that what we did was we said that let's assume that accelerations are zero, in which case we're left with just dp dz equals zero, which is this term here. And we parlayed, if you like, uh, this term into two overarching equations, one for an incompressible fluid, a liquid, in which case the pressure is equal to an original pressure plus a height of the column multiplied by its unit weight. Uh, 
And uh, we drew that, uh, if I paraphrase what we did, we did it in terms of pressure versus elevation. Our z coordinate is always positive upwards. And we saw that, uh, let me do this. If I draw a barrier there, then we saw that this expression looks a bit like this and this. And of course, the description of exactly what this derivative is is it's just that this is dz dp. And so if this is just over 1, then this would be equal to uh, unit weight and 1. The slope of this is just the unit weight. That's, that's all this expression is saying. Um, the other trivial uh, result was that if we go horizontally in a fluid, we end up at the same pressure by definition. Uh, and that's, well, that's, that's interesting as well, I guess, because if you look at drawing a horizontal line, and if you look at a hurricane, the eye of a hurricane, and we look at drawing a, uh, a section A to A prime across it, then we might think that the water level within the hurricane might look at this. Not because this is um, pressure, but this is elevation. And so if the pressure in the center of a hurricane can be 0 0.9 bars, an atmospheric pressure that we feel now is one bar, one atmosphere, one baromic, barometric pressure, one unit of barometric pressure, and it's one bar out of here, then that means that the differential between these two pressures is 0.1 of a bar. 0 0.1 bar equals 0 0.1 times 101 kPa. So this change in pressure is equal to something like 10 kPa. The unit weight of water, H gamma equals, this is the, the pressure change. So where is it? I've lost it. It is pressure difference between the inside and the outside. So we could rearrange this to be able to give us H is equal to P over unit weight. So this is equal to 10, uh, uh, 1,000. Uh, so the pressure change is 0.1 of a bar, so it's 101. So it's 10 kilonewtons. Let me get rid of that. squared. The unit weight of fluid, unit weight of water is equal to 10 kilonewtons per meter squared, meters cubed, I guess. So that's equal to one meter. And so in other words, if you know that the pressure as you move horizontally doesn't change, the pressure at this point, if you remember the, uh, the Capri tube that we did, we said that the pressure as you go from outside to inside has to be the same as you go horizontally, and therefore we could cut it at the bottom and do a free body diagram. The pressure at this point here has to be the same as this point here, and so the fact that this is at a, a lower pressure at the surface means that this maximum height driven by the difference in barometric pressure across the hurricane can be one meter. Quite substantially if you think about it, but it's not going to be the three meters or four meters that you need for the size of the storm surge that they're expecting in, uh, in the, uh, the big bend of, uh, of Florida. So, anyway. so some random thoughts for this morning in getting things going. So what we'll do is we'll use these ideas that we had before. We know that for um, an incompressible fluid, which is usually the case, often the case for what we're dealing with, then this is the expression. It's slightly more involved if we're dealing with a compressible fluid because the compressibility means that as you get a larger 
mass of material on top of it, it will compress so it'll be more dense and therefore the, it's more dense at sea level and it's less dense at high altitude and so it'll asymptote to this uh, absolute zero magnitude here. And so if we just write this out, so this is zero kPa absolute. This is minus 101 kPa gauge. So these are the anchor points for our pressures. Uh, as we mentioned last time, if we do it in, that's the, the wrong way around, isn't it? Sorry. No, that's right. Sorry. That's right. So the anchor points for the gauge pressure that we use is zero at the pressure we feel now, which is actually 101 plus. So this would be minus 101. So at atmospheric, this would be zero. So this is gauge pressure as we go across here. So. And so this is curved because uh, the, the density of uh, the air is changing from high density here to much lower density here. If you look at the fluid, if you look at the density of water here, if you're going uh, below sea level, the density at these two locations doesn't change uh, because the modulus is uh, the same value. So that's what we dealt with last time. So what we'll deal with today is we'll talk about methods of measuring pressure. And so we'll use these so-called manometer rules to be able to measure the magnitudes of pressure we see. There's one thing, I'll, I'll take an excursion before we go there, uh, just to make the, a point. Um, and that is that we, we evaluated the change in pressure as we go down, as we go up in the atmosphere. Implicitly, what we assumed was that the temperature equals constant. And that's a simplification. Uh, you know that when you take off at uh, ground level, 20 degrees centigrade or so, typically when you get up to cruising altitude, the temperature might be minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees centigrade. I think minus 40 Fahrenheit and minus 40 centigrade are identical. That's where the scales cross. So 60 minus 60 uh, Fahrenheit and uh, Celsius aren't congruent, but it's of that order. And so if you look at the temperature profile in the atmosphere, then you might want to modify what we do in our expression that we got. And so, for instance, as we look at, at sea level, we're, in this case it looks like this is 15 degrees C. If you go up to um, 10,000 meters, 10 kilometer, 10,000 meters, then you're at minus 60. And so if you look at the span of these temperatures, then the change in clearly temperature isn't a constant if you look at it in this expression that we evaluated. So you could accommodate that by allowing for the fact that temperature is some function of elevation. And so you could represent the fact that this is a change in temperature, which I guess is 75 degrees centigrade, and it occurs over 10,000 meters. And so you could use this expression, for instance, to define temperature as a function of the temperature at ground level minus the rate of change of temperature with elevation. So if this expression wants to add apples to apples, and this is in oranges, so med uh, degrees Kelvin or centigrade, degrees uh, centigrade, this is going to be, this has to be in units of D temperature DZ, DZ, right? This units. The Zs cancel out, and this is in temperatures, so this beta value must be in change in temperature with elevation. So beta must equal dt dz, which from this is just 75 centigrade divided by 10,000 meters. So it would be uh, 1 to 0 0.0075 um, degrees, sorry, degrees C per meter is beta. 
And so what you could do is you could do this integration allowing for the fact that temperature changes as you go up. The, that becomes part of the integral and you end up with a slightly different expression. And I won't use equatio because I had such a hard time with it last time. But if I show you the inner workings of my, my life, I, we didn't have this class last year because your predecessors had given me COVID. I don't mind. I had two weeks off. It was great. <laughs> uh, so you, you see that these things repeat from year to year. So, so this is the equatio stamp. So I'm not sure which one is which. This is the, the red one is the one we had the other day, which is temp temperature invariant, 20 degrees centigrade or whatever the ground temperature is all the way up. The blue one actually goes to zero much faster. This is spurious. That's not real because the equation, you have to change the temperatures or all these different increments, right? We just changed it from zero to 10,000 feet. Above 10,000 feet, you saw it was constant at minus 60, and then it warmed up again, which is interesting. I don't know why. And so as you get up here, it would be almost uh, absolute zero pressure. The, uh, the guys who were launching their balloon in the Bay Area looked like it went up to 90,000 feet. 100,000 feet must be about 30,000 meters. So 30,000 meters is right here. So uh, it's actually probably not much uh, air, very, very low density air. So I guess if you're trying to breathe there, you might be having a hard time, of course. No one was trying to breathe. So, so anyway, so that's the last thing to, to close that out. I won't go through that in any detail, but... And people asked last time about gauge pressure. This is uh, um, a definition, the same diagram that I drew before. So how do we measure uh, pressures? How do we know what the pressure is in our atmosphere? How do we know it's minus uh, 101 kilopascals gauge uh, that we sit at? How do we get that absolute measurement? Well, one way to do that is, of course, to do it with our friend... the smiling lab prof, and I'll just let this play. We looked at this for those of you who came in early. And so we could measure it with a, a, a manometer or a barometer. I'm not sure whether this is called. A manometer is usually a YouTube manometer. This is what's in a barometer. I don't know. This seems to be old worldy these days. You might have grandparents who have a barometer in their back room where you tap it to see if the pressure is going up or down as a predictor of how the weather is going to change. Those barometers are usually attached. It's, if it's a, a dial, it's attached to a, a tube that has, uh, as we'll talk about later, a tube that has a curve in it. And as pressure changes on the tube, it kind of bends the tube and it turns the, uh, the axis of the, um, uh, of the dial. And so what this is, is you take do you, do, do you use mercury in your chemistry classes at school? No one used mercury? Oh, you cowards. <laughs> Afraid of dying? <laughs> well, this is stuff that scurries across the, the lab bench and across floors, these little globules. And then you have to, well, you, in my day, you never got the hazmat team in. You just picked it up with your hands and did whatever you did with it. But I guess we're a bit, a bit more aware of it. Hey, I'm still alive. I may be crazy, but I'm still alive. And so you fill up your tube with mercury. Um, and you fill it up as much as you can to the top. Um, and then you're wearing gloves, of course, because you don't want any contact. And then you top it up to make sure there's absolutely no air within the tube. Air bubbles will float to the top. Put your finger over the end of it to lock the amount in. And you dump it in a tray of mercury itself. In the, in a, it looks like a Petri dish, not quite a Petri dish. And so what happens with that is the weight of the mercury is such that it will detach from the, the roof of the tube under its self-weight because it's pulling down, and it will leave a gap. I, would, I was going to say an air gap, but of course it's not an air gap. It's a gap with its own vapor. And so what's happened is that the mercury has cavitated. It's failed in tension as a bubble, and that bubble happens to be no air, because there's no air in it. It's pure mercury vapor. And mercury vapor has its uh, own characteristic is it has a vapor pressure at which it turns into vapor, just like water has a vapor pressure when it turns into a vapor. And so we know that vapor pressure, and so that gives us a, a way to calibrate exactly what the pressure is within the room at the bottom. And so that's, that's all we're attempting to do here. So that is our 
segue, if you like, into talking about this. So, so this is the, the basic idea. So we have, and I'm, I'm going to avoid that, what we'll do is we'll use what I've referred to as the manometer rules. And there are about five of them, and they're written cryptically here. Um, but I'll explain exactly what they are, probably with a new diagram. And I'll use as a, an, an explanation What is it? One unit weight. Taking a lot of time, I know. Bear with me. So, we've done this before. And so the manometer rules are that if you go from, uh, if you go up in elevation, then you subtract a pressure. If you go down in elevation, you add a pressure. Oops. So these cryptic things here, up in pressure, you subtract. Down, sorry, down in elevation, up in elevation, you subtract a pressure. So this is Z, this is P. If you go down in elevation, you add a pressure. Just like going down in a swimming pool, you're going to feel um, increase in pressure. If you go horizontally, there's no pressure change from what we've talked about, about storm surges and manometers. If the tube is evacuated, just like in our barometer, then by definition, the pressure is equal to PV. And because the unit weight of gas divided by the unit weight of a liquid is roughly equal to one kilogram per cubic uh, meter times gravity over 1,000 cubic meters, for water anyway, because this ratio is so small, that when you go up or down in a gas, we don't care, typically, in, in a measuring system. So those are the, the manometer rules. Five of them total, right? Up, decrease pressure. Down, increase pressure. Move horizontally, it doesn't change. Evacuated, it's a vapor pressure. And if you move up or down in a gas, then probably you can disregard the fact that you're going up or down. So we'll spend some time just going through examples today. The, the first example is this. And so the easiest way to do this is to start off at the place um, where you know the pressure. Uh, or no, start off the place where you know what the pressure is and end up the place where you'd like to know it. So in this case, we start off, let me do it in blue. So we start off here. We go down some height h and we end up at this point here so this is minus unit weight of mercury times h that gives us the pressure so this is our pressure at b and that if we go here because we're on the same elevation is equal to pb and so if we know the vapor pressure of mercury and if we know the unit weight of mercury and its height, then we can find out what the atmospheric pressure is. Vapor pressures are always given in ab absolute pressure, or usually given in absolute pressures. And I have it written down. So um, the density of mercury is something like 13,000 something, 13,600 kilograms per meter cubed. The vapor pressure of mercury is 0 0.025, 0 0.025 bars. 
and we know a bar is 101 kPa. In other words, it's 0.25% uh, of atmospheric pressure, essentially zero. So this is essentially zero. And so if we take this as being zero, and then we work this out, then we know that atmospheric pressure is equal to 13,600 times 9.81 divided by, no, multiplied by, times h. And so we can rearrange that. Can I be clever? Um, and so if we know, I guess if we know this, I should have done it the other way, this is 10. So you measure this, obviously. I think actually I'm going to do it this way. I think this height was actually 0.7 of 74 meters. It's probably written down here. Let's see if that's right. 74 meters. So does that work? Does, will this? One, three, six hundred. First times times ten. Well, can do nine point eight one times zero point seven four. Are we off by a factor of ten? Oh, I did. I put 136,000, not 13.6. So it gives us 98,728.8 uh, um, pascals, right? So this number up here, if you see it, is uh, not quite 101,000 pascals. It's 98,000 pascals. And so that's, uh, that's the, the result. The reason that we use mercury is that uh, if we used water, the vapor pressure of water is equal to 0 0.03 bar. So it's actually 10 times larger, roughly, but still trivial. It's 1% of atmospheric pressure. So also we could assume that that's zero. The one re what's the other reason that we, we perhaps don't use, we prefer to use this horrible substance, mercury, rather than water in this? No? So if you use, if, if uh, the column of water you have to do to measure is 10 times larger because it's, uh, well, 13 times larger, right? Because it's mainly based on the density. So the density is uh, 13 times smaller, then the column is going to be 13 times larger. So the column of water you'd have to use to, u to measure a cavitated bubble of air in the top of the column would be something like 30 feet of water, three stories. And so that's, it. So that's the, um, the, the, the reason we don't use water. Okay? So manometry is the way that we typically measure pressures in systems. And there are a variety of systems that we can imagine that we might want to know this for. One is for piezometers. So if you uh, want to know what the pressure is in the bottom of a well, if you want to know how quickly water flows in your aquifer, then you have two wells or your reservoir. You have two wells go into your aquifer or reservoir. You measure the pressures between those locations. And then you use that pressure gradient, the difference in pressure with length, to put into Darcy's law. Darcy's law says that the velocity, if you have two wells that measure the pressure at an upstream location, and a downstream location in your aquifer, then you can calculate the velocity at which water flows or oil flows through there as a function of permeability, dynamic viscosity, and the pressure drop as you go, not Z, as you go along your system. And this would be elevation. And so if you want to measure pressure within your reservoir, then you can do that by just using exactly what we did before. You want to know what PA is, so you'd start off at this location. You'd end up with P0. You're starting off at this location. You're going down, so you'd subtract H1. Unit weight of water 
whatever the fluid is, uh, is equal to PA, not atmospheric pressure now. And so if you know that this, if you're doing the calculation in gauge pressure, then this would be zero. If, uh, if you know the unit weight of the fluid that fills your well, oil or water, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter or less if it's oil. If you know the height to the bottom of the well or the depth of the well, then for hydrostatic conditions or oilostatic conditions, I don't know if that's a word, multiplied by the unit weight of the fluid gives you the pressure at the bottom. If you have two particular locations where you measure it, then you'd have a pressure gradient between those locations and then you could calculate, if you knew what the permeability is of this system, you could calculate how quickly the fluid is traveling between those locations. If you draw down the pressure in the well even further, as you would if you wanted to pump it, then water will flow to the well or oil will flow to the well and you pump it out and you're able to uh, calculate it quantitatively in what it goes. All right. Manometers are the other form of these geometries that we have. Again, the same, same idea. You'll see lots of these figures. These aren't spherical uh, lab um, vessels, but they're typically um, pipelines disappearing into the page. So this is a pipeline that's flowing into the page. You want to measure the pressure in the pipeline at a particular location. You do it with a gauge fluid and a U-tube manometer, which is what this is and you do exactly the same as we've done before. It, you want to know what the pressure is at point A, and so you start off at a place where you know the pressure. If it's open to the atmosphere, you certainly know the pressure at this point, and you work your way through the system to be able to do that. The gauge fluid may be different from the fluid which is above it. Of course, it's different from this one if it's air. This may be a gas or a liquid in here, but it would have some unit weight. And so if you want to do this, uh, you'd write an equation. Start off a place where you know P4. You go down to a place which is below you. So you're going down, so you're subtracting. Minus H2 times the unit weight of the fluid, of the gauge fluid. That gets you at this point here. You could also subtract this amount off, go across here, and add this amount. Or you can realize that you can just go across here through the fluid and end up here at this point. So P3 and P2 have to be the same. And as you go up to this point here, then you're adding. So add H1 multiplied by gauge fluid 1, and that equals PA. PA is the fluid you want to know. You know if you're working in gauge fluid, or if you work in absolute fluid, then this is either zero, or it's either um, 101 kPa. So depending on which one of these you're using, um, this is the, the anchor pressure. You know the unit weight of the gauge fluid, you know its height, you know the unit weight of the fluid that's in here. You know the height differential. And so you have everything you know to be able to calculate this. If unit weight 1 happens to be a gas, then going up from this point to this point, if unit weight uh, is um, 1 approaches 0, then you can just get rid of this term here. So that's the fifth of our, our rules, right? The rules were if you go up in a fluid, you subtract pressures. If you go down in a fluid, you add pressures. Go horizontally, as we did here, the pressures are the same. If you're in an evacuated space where there was a, no air space and now there's a vapor, then it's the pressure of the vapor that is, uh, applies. And if you go up in a gas, then typically the density of the gas is trivial and you can ignore it. And so in this case, the equation that you get for P1 is just exactly as we, we wrote here. I won't put numbers into it, but you can do that. You don't need to do it as this. This is a, a previous incarnation of this class. The easiest way to, is to do it just as I say. Start off the place you know, and then work to the place that you'd like to know. And it, it follows. What else? These are the rules written out. If you want to see them, uh, we've talked about them. 
Again, another example, it gets a bit old after a while uh, doing all these. It's no different from what we've done before. If you want a numerical example, I guess we can do it. Here we have uh, air outside. We have uh, water in here. We have a gauge fluid, which happens to be mercury, which is our 13,000, well, it was 600. Um, oh, I guess this has changed because this is a unit weight, not a density. 9.81, not 10 times this. And so if we want to calculate PA, what would it be? Let's do it the same way we've... Go uh, down, so we add 5 meters times gamma Hg. We end up at this point here. We could go uh, down another 2. So we end up at this location here. We go across here, you can't see very well because it's red on red, and we end up at this point here. Um, and we go up, we could go up um, 2 plus 5 plus 5, and then down 5 plus 5. Or we could also just go up uh, minus 2 times gamma H2O equals P A. Uh, I guess we could also write it, simplify it as um, 5 plus 2 meters times gamma Hg minus 2 times unit weight HTO, H2O equals P A. We have to remember that these gauge fluids are not the same in terms of unit weight, and so we have to accommodate that. But if you look down here, presumably this is the 7 that comes out of this term here, and this is the 2, and you get a numerical result of this. So that, that's it. So that's, that's all we have to do to do that. Uh, so I guess, um, so I don't know, which ones do we want to do this? It gets to be the same. These are in um, uh, different units. There's a whole bunch of examples for you to use. It just becomes uh, uh, the same. In this particular case, it's written a bit more complicated. It's written in terms of uh, specific gravities. The definition of specific gravity is just the multiplier you need to put on to the unit weight of water or the density of water to get the unit weight of the other fluid or density of the other fluid. So the specific gravity of mercury is 13.6. So it's 13.6 times the density of water, just by definition. And you can see exactly what we do there. Now, the, the examples are there. I, I, I don't want to go through it. I'm going to go through maybe there's one other example and make, make a point. So the other thing that within these U-tubes is that we want to be able to measure a differential height between the meniscus on one side of the tube and the other. So it makes sense if the U-tube is not like this, but it's like this, and they typically are very close to each other. Incidentally, if you want to be able, if you're putting a foundation in your house and you want to level the foundation, the easiest way to do that is to get 30 feet of Tigon tubing, the, the clear tubing that you use in the labs, put water in it, put the water at the place where you want to get the level and take it 10 feet away from it and just work until you get the same level in the water. Obviously, the levels have to be the same, quite naturally. If you want to be able to measure the differential between the, the pressures very accurately, if it's a small differential height and therefore a small pressure differential, you can do a couple of different things. You can use mercury, or I guess you don't want to use mercury, right? You, you want to use water, where it would accentuate that difference because it's a less dense fluid. Or you could use an inclined pressure manometer. And so this just means that instead of measuring the absolute height difference between 0.1 and 0.2, which might not be very high, you could measure the length along this tube, which will be kind of amplified by its distance traveling along that, uh, that trajectory. And so all you need to do is write this height differential in terms of the length along the tube, 
multiplied by its inclination, the sine of its inclination. And so if you write the manometer equations, you can write them into, this would be unit weight 2 times h2. h2 would be the difference between this point here, at this level here, and this point here. So this is h2. And if you write h2 in terms of this expression, then, bless you, this is h2. And so in your equation that you get, uh, if you measure the length along it, which has much higher resolution than measuring the vertical change, then you get a more accurate reading of your, uh, your pressure, which you might want to get or not. So that's that. And then finally, our parting shot on this is how you might measure those if you're not using manometers. And so what you could use is a, a Bourdon gauge. And I mentioned before, if you look at the barometers that you might see in houses that measure the pressure with a dial gauge, or if you look at a pressure dial gauge uh, where you get a, an analog reading for the pressure rather than a digital one, then the principle that it works on is having this curved tube. So this is just a curved tube, which is sealed. It has a, a gas at some pressure in it. And as the pressure outside that tube acting on the tube changes, it's sufficiently flexible that the C changes to be more open or more closed. And so the diff distance between this point here and this point here changes as it kind of deforms, as pressure changes. And you link this uh, mobile portion to something that allows you to record that. So typically, if it's uh, in a, an analog pressure gauge, then you'd have on here something like a, uh, a serrated gear. And you'd have like a, a cog on a wheel that would be attached to a spindle. And as this serrated gear goes up and down, it turns this cog, which has a, a pointer on it, which gives you the analog pressure reading on the, on the dial. Very simple. Of course, everything now is digital. So you could use this Bourdon gauge attached to an LVDT linear voltage differential transducer, which is just a, a magnetic core that goes through another magnetic core that is attached to uh, um, the, the gauge at the top. As the core goes through it, there's an electrical uh, reading that tells you how far the displacement is going through the core. You get a digital readout, and you record that. And the height, uh, the distance it moves vertically is just a digital reading of this uh, change. If you're measuring pressures in piezometers in the subsurface in, uh, say, a Superfund site to look at the pressure difference between two locations on your site, what you could use is a pneumatic piezometer. So a piezometer that gets buried in the ground with sand around it so it's permeable. If you imagine an infinitely flexible membrane that hits here, then the water pressure acting on this will push it into contact with the anvil here. If you want to measure the pressure of the water here, what you could do is you could pump gas into this piezometer. It'll increase and increase and increase, but it won't flow. At the moment it flows, it'll push this membrane off this anvil at the back. And when you have a connection between the inlet and outlet, that has to be equivalent to the pressure you have in situ. So you can measure it in that way. And so those are pre-digital ways of trying to measure these things. Uh, the, post di the, the current digital methods or the early digital methods would be using pressure transducers. Pressure transducers work actually in a bit of the same way as this, and that is that you have a pressure transducer, has an air gap behind it, but a membrane in front of it. This membrane will be attached to maybe a strain gauge that measures displacement, just like uh, the LVDT here, but Usually a strain gauge gets stretched or compressed. And as it does that, the resistance, electrical resistance of it changes. And if you measure the electrical resistance change, you can measure the change in displacement. And so you calibrate the transducer so that at a given pressure, it gives you a given displacement. And so this finite stiffness membrane, as it deforms, it's a, um, it reports as a proxy a displacement that you can calibrate directly with a pressure that's applied. And of course, the most recent ways of doing this is by using piezoelectrics. 
piezoelectrics are just materials that if you squeeze them in your finger, it makes a voltage. And as you squeeze it, it gives you a voltage output as it's changing pressure. And so you can record the change in pressure as you go up and down just by the, the digital readout from that. And so that's the other way to, to be able to do that. And I've never been quite sure how a, an analog tire pressure gauge works. You know, you have this stick, you put it on the, the, uh, the, the nozzle, the valve of the tire, and the, the inner core rises to a height. I presume that it works by the uh, inner core pushes out. It has a certain weight to it. As it gets pushed out, then the area of the interior changes, and so the pressure that's acting on the bottom of this changes as the width of the receptacle that's present in changes. So the, the height that it rises to is some measurement of the pressure that's acting at the bottom of the pressure gauge. Higher pressure means it gets pushed up higher, which is kind of how it works. So that's it. Two minutes ago. Um, we'll go next time we'll go through a bunch of examples. So we'll have examples up the wazoo. So we've talked about the theory, I guess, so far in what we've dealt with in this class. We've talked about material properties in the first week. Uh, so far, two classes into the second week, we've talked about pressure at a point, how that relies on the material above us in some very simple differential equation, which we can convert into these manometer rules. And then we can use these manometer rules to say something about practical systems that we care maybe about. And so on Friday, uh, we'll talk about that. So that's all I've got today. Don't forget Thursday, uh, your assignments to do before midnight. <laughs>